the Buddha's last words were to become consummate through being heedful. Becoming consummate, of course, meant developing the path to its fullness, so that it can take you all the way to release. And the way to do that, he said, was through being heedful. The Pali word is apamadena. And it's interesting, that word heedful. It's not one that we use much in ordinary, everyday language. And all the other words that could be used for translating apamadena by being vigilant, by being non-complacent. These aren't words that we use in everyday language. They're perfectly good words, we know their meaning, but in terms of using them in our active vocabulary, they tend to disappear. We'd much rather be hear the word trust, being trustful. We'd like to be able to trust in certain things, trust that our innate nature is to be wise, our innate nature is to be awakened, and that we can trust in our nature to take care of these things for us. But that's not what the Buddha taught. He said you have to be really careful, you have to be watchful, you can't be complacent. There are dangers out there, and there are dangers in here as well. In fact, the dangers out there come from the dangers in here. And if you're not careful, the dangers in here are going to take over. So you have to be heedful, you have to be watchful. The Buddha once said that the all skillful mental qualities are rooted in heedfulness and have heedfulness as their leader. It's because we're heedful, the dangers out there, that we take the energy to develop skill in the mind. We see that we're suffering, that we're surrounded by suffering, and suffering lies, a lot of the suffering lies ahead of us, if we're not careful. And it's through being careful, through being heedful, not being complacent, that we can do something about it. That's the important message here. It, we can do something about this suffering. That aging, illness, and death are lying in wait, and they're not pretty things. Sometimes you hear people saying that you shouldn't, we shouldn't badmouth aging, illness, and death. There's a, a beautiful side to them as well, like a flower that's wilting. That's, but it's a miserable experience being an aging person, being an ill person, being a dying person. And you look at all the indignities and all the suffering and all the the pain and anguish that serves no purpose at all. It's just there. It just loads you down. It seems, doesn't seem like it serves any purpose that we have to die with a lot of pain or have our bodily functions leave us one by one by one so that we're totally dependent on other people. It serves no purpose, but that's the way things are. They might say that trying to get out of this is being aversive to life, but it's, it's being realistic and it's being true to our hearts. We don't want to go through that needless suffering. And the Buddha says there's a way out. And when there's a way out, that doesn't, it means trying to find that way out is not being aversive, it's being intelligent. As with any danger in life, if you see a way, a way out of the danger, you take the way to safety. Here though, the safety is something we have to find in our own minds, in the midst of these qualities that we can't trust within ourselves our laziness, our complacency, our willingness to put up with second best, our desire to turn the responsibility over to somebody else, either a great teacher or some divine being, or just hope that the, the way of the world will take care of us. We'll look at the, what the way of the world is. I remember going to Alaska years back, one of the last real wildernesses we have here in the country. And being impressed by how implacable the whole thing was, that the wilderness would not give one damn if I died. If I died nicely, if I died a miserable death, it wouldn't care. And being surrounded by all that indifference was a sobering experience. That's the way of nature. Animals die. Before they die, sometimes they go through a lot of pain and anguish. So it's up to us to make the difference, to make sure that we're not going to suffer from those things. And that means we have to be very watchful, very heedful, because as I said, the danger comes from within us. We have this tendency to get sloppy. We're meditating and things get good for a while, and we get careless. 
we get inattentive. We get complacent. And it's precisely these qualities that are going to do us in. When things go well, we have to keep reminding ourselves that, okay, they can get better. How do they get better? Well, for one thing, when you get a good state in the concentration, you try to maintain it. Do what you can to keep it going. This requires skill. In other words, how to hold on to it. Not so tightly that you squeeze it to death and not so loosely that you lose it. It's like holding a baby chick in your hand. You have to watch and see what works. It's interesting that the Buddha doesn't ever define the term heedfulness or apamata in any place in the, in the canon, but he does give instructions on how to be heedful, how to develop heedfulness. Realizing that the problem comes from within, he says the first place you've got to look is in your intentions. Before you sit down and meditate, before you do anything at all, he says, look at what your, the quality of the intention is. Is it going to be skillful or not? If it's not a skillful intention, don't act on it. If it is skillful, be clear about it. Like when you're meditating, sit down. Remember, you have a purpose to be here. Remind yourself of that purpose every time you meditate. This is why we have the chatting in the evening. When you're meditating on your own, take the time to remind yourself, why am I meditating? Well, there are a lot of dangers here in the mind. You've got to learn how to sidestep them. You've got to learn how to cut through them. So be clear about what you're doing. Don't just go through the motions because you have X number of periods that you've got to sit during the day. So here we do, just put it in time. Be careful, be diligent, be scrupulous in looking at what's going on. And check for the results. That's the other side of heedfulness. When you do something that you think is going to be good, look at the results while you're doing it and after it's done. And be honest about the results. What kind of results are you really getting from the practice? What could you change to get better results? This principle applies all the way from just basically getting used to the principle of karma, getting used to the principle of being a responsible person on the external level, and going all the way through into the very refined states of concentration. Even when the Buddha is talking about emptiness, it follows the same pattern. Be clear about what you're doing. Once you can maintain a good state of concentration, he says, then the next step is to look at what's going on. Where is there still disturbance in this concentration? And you find the disturbance is something that you're doing. It's the way you're creating that state of oneness in the mind. The oneness itself is a disturbance. It's based on a particular perception. Now, what do you do? If you let go of the oneness, if you go back to having your mind scattered all over the place, that's not settled, skillful. The skillful thing is to go to more subtle states of wellness, oneness, based on more subtle perceptions. In other words, when you see that you're fo the way you're focused on your object is causing stress, learn to focus in a way that's less stressful, causes less of a disturbance to the mind. And you can pursue this all the way through the various levels of concentration, even to a level the Buddhist calls the themeless concentration of awareness where there's no specific perception at all. It's, it's almost like you're not meditating, but there's a, the mind is centered, simply that it doesn't have a particular theme or object for its being centered, not even a formless one. And even there the Buddha says, watch it carefully. You look at it really carefully. And this takes very subtle perception, very intent perception. You begin to see even there there's an element of being fabricated. It's willed. So look, okay, you learn how to drop that, realizing that it wasn't the sort of underlying principle of the nature or the underlying awareness of reality that you thought it was. But to see this requires that you, you have to be wary about what's going on. That's another translation of apamana, wariness. Not so wary that you are not willing to get into the concentration and work at it and develop it. But once you're there, that you don't get complacent about it, that you don't allow yourself to be deceived about it, to think that it's more than what it is. This is your protection in the practice, to make sure that you don't settle for second best, so that you don't leave yourself open to dangers that are out there, that are in here. 
So what it comes down to is being very clear and very scrupulous about your intentions, about what you're doing, and the results that you're getting. If you see the results are not up to, up to par, not up to what you want, okay, what can you do to change what you're doing? Be honest about it. This principle of honesty is what underlies the whole principle of being non-complacent. The Buddha once said this was his one prerequisite for someone he would take on as a student. He said, bring me someone who's honest, and I'll teach that person the Dharma. So this is what we have to learn how to trust. We have to learn how to trust ourselves, make ourselves trustworthy people. Because no matter what promises you get from outside, the test is inside. This is another function of being heedful, learning to test things. Test yourself. Test particular practices as they're recommended to you. When insights arise in your meditation, again, you can't be complacent. You've got to test them as well. It's only when things pass the test that you can have a, sen a really secure sense that you can trust some of these things. But you've got to find out which things you can trust and which things you can't. We'd like to think that all the teachings that are out there are simply different ways of getting up to the top of the mountain. It depends on which way you choose, but all of them are guaranteed to work. They're not. Just like all rivers don't flow into the ocean, some of them flow into the Great Basin and just disappear. So how are we going to know what works? We have to test things. We have to put ourselves to the test and keep reminding ourselves that no matter how good things get in the meditation, you have to be wary. You have to watch out. Because of the ability of the mind to deceive itself is so prevalent, so pervasive. And the only way we can get beyond that self-deception is being very scrupulous, very careful, very clear about what we're doing. It's a quality of the Buddha called ardency. And this is what sees us through. This is why the Buddha made it his last instruction. Because this quality will get all the good results we want. He could have ended his teaching career by giving platitudes about emptiness or nirvana or the deathless. But there was no need for that. He said, if you work on this quality of non-complacency, that's what's going to get you there. So this is the heart of the practice. This is the heart of the teaching. And it's aimed at giving our heart what it really wants. Our heart doesn't want to be life-affirming. It wants to be happiness-affirming. That there is a true happiness, that there is a deathless happiness, something we can really depend on. That's what we really want. And so it's this quality of self self honesty, willing to test, test, test things over again because you're not complacent, because you're wary and heedful and vigilant. That's what's going to see you through. That's what's going to deliver release.